uh, have all the different lessons in a hat and have you guys pull it because I have all the rest of the lessons ready. And just whichever one you guys pulled to be whichever one I, whenever, whichever one I taught tonight. And uh, then I was like, no, I can't do that to Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyways, as you see here, um, we're talking about the charismatic cult tonight. Um, and you'll notice that with a lot of things with, with this, it's going to be that it's not necessarily not true. It's not true in extreme measures. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll give reference to those things that I'm specifically talking about. But, um, well, anyways. So go ahead and go to the, go to the uh, first slide there. Okay. So a lot of... <laughs> A lot of charismatic people are genuinely, they mean well, <laughs> they mean well, but they are completely ignorant of scripture. And so what they'll do is they'll latch onto a verse that to them sounds good at the time and just kind of run with it. You know, um, you'll find that the majority of times they don't really understand the Old Testament, how it applies to us today, that kind of stuff. So they'll just like grab certain parts of the Old Testament and just, I mean, that's just, I guess, how it's going to be. You know what I mean? Like, um very, very one-sided on, on the Old Testament. You know, oh, you, will you translate this here? Why don't you translate it the same way over here? Well, because that's not a promise I like. It's like, <laughs> well, okay, I, I guess that's a conclusion. It's very important that when we study the Bible, we do it in a consistent manner. The Bible, there is a right and a wrong way to understand it. And if you, if you go to the Bible with the understanding that it's just what I get from it rather than what it actually means, you're going to be led astray to all kinds of stupid things. And uh, so, uh, one of the things that, that that is very foundational to charismatic uh, people that get really weird on this is Israel prom Israel's promises transfer to America. We're going to talk about this later, but um, in, in another lesson. But one of the ways that this applies is there's actually a belief that the twelve tribes that were lost um, after the exile from the Old Testament that they eventually went into the um, England areas and that whatnot, and so now the promises directly apply to both England and America, um, because you know America came from the settlers who came from England and all that. So, anyways, um, and obviously just completely retarded, but that's part of uh, some people believe in, in, in that kind of thing, even though it's unfounded. Um, but but there is this idea that everything in the Old Testament directly corresponds with me right here today. Like, as an example, um, we're going to look at 2 Corinthians 7, 14, but another one is Jeremiah 29, 11, where, you know, um, where he says, I know the plans I have for you. God is in the process, in that portion, of kicking his people out of the promised land because they have failed. Basically, what he's saying is, I'm disciplining you for a reason. Okay. So now we blindly quote that today when a, a realistic um, application for us today would be, sometimes... We do really dumb things, and God has to discipline us. But even in his disciplining, he knows what's best. Yeah. That would be how it applies to us today. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. Completely different than, than all the college or uh, high school graduate cards say. So, I mean, come on. How many times have you seen that on someone who graduated from high school? Oh, yeah. You know, on the bottom corner, Jeremiah 29 11. It's like, how does that apply to this situation? God is punishing you by sending you to college? <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, um, but... Um, 2 Chronicles 7, 14 is another one that um, is just a little bit taken out of context. Um, and, and like I say, this isn't something that's necessarily not true, just not true in the extremes that they take it. The promises in the Old Testament still apply to the Christians in context. You can't blindly take everything in the Old Testament and say, this applies to me today. Okay, For instance, we aren't getting the, getting the land, the geographical location in Israel. We aren't, we aren't doing that. Everybody know that? Just FYI. Okay. Uh, Second Chronicles 7.14. Um, so Solomon builds this temple, which King David had. It's set in his heart to do, and God says, no, don't build it. Your son's going to build it. So Solomon finally builds it, and he does this kind of public thing, uh, kind of like a, um, a grand reveal, if you will. Okay. And during the process of this... Um, God kind of, there's this kind of interaction between God. Um, and it says here, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and will heal their land. Now what people take this to mean in the charismatic world is that America needs to turn from their sins and in so doing, 
um, there will be, you know, all, all overfillings of blessings and, um, you know, um, oh, I can't remember any of the specific things now, but, you know, um, things like the, the remember what, the flooding of Louisiana, remember that? Oh, that was, a, that was obviously a sign from God. Um, regardless of the fact that they built a city, Katrina, Katrina, yeah, uh, they built a city right on next to the ocean where they have a lot of hurricanes, <laughs> but it was God's, you know what I mean? Not to say that things just randomly happen in history. God knows what's going on in the world. I'm not saying that, but everything becomes super spiritualized. And if America would just turn, then God would lift them up into the Christian nation that they once were. Let me tell you America's background, okay? They used to be very involved with the slave trade, with the alcohol trade, among many other sins, it, all kinds of sinful things. And do you know why they came to America in the first place? So that they wouldn't have to be a witness in their home. They separated themselves into a bunch of closed-off communities where you had to be their specific view of Christianity to live there. That's not Christianity at all. That's, that's, that's being monks. You know, that, that's, I, I'm going to go off and live separate from everybody else because I'm just tired of being persecuted. Enjoy your mountaintop experience because that's exactly the opposite of what God told you to do. See what I mean? How does this apply to us today? When we as Christians disobey God, there is punishment that follows. When we as Christians repent to God, God will open up that. I, I told you about this before. When we sin, we don't lose our salvation all of a sudden. We, be, we build up a wall between us and God, and those, those promises become distance. Does that make sense? And so when we repent, God starts, starts working in us, and those blessings start flowing again. Once again, following God produces blessings. However, that doesn't mean that everything in the Old Testament magically applies to me because it's a good word. Okay? We need to be very discerning because I've heard many, many times by people like... Um, um, Joel Osteen, you know, about, you know, all these blessings and nonsense, that, you know, this, this prosperity teaching that is just so not true. You know, it's just not true. Job was a righteous man, and he was still had all kinds of unfair things happen to him, okay? Paul was a good guy. He ended up being killed by an emperor in Rome, in a savage way, which he didn't deserve at all. Same goes for Peter. I mean, he was a relatively a nice guy. He was a little squeamish at some parts, a little bit too vocal at other parts. But he overall, he was a good guy. But he ended up dying in, in, in the Colosseum in Rome too. See what I mean? Well, bad things happen to good people. It's just a fact of life. I know some people who, who you know, really good godly people and their kids die of cancer. What are you going to say that... Like the like the two like the people say to Jesus, you know, it was this for a sin that he did, or that he would eventually do, or maybe his parents do did this, or what's going on here, God? You know, who's to blame? Who's to blame? So another thing that goes hand in hand with this is anything Jewish is instantly superior, instantly, regardless of whether it, it whether it actually applies or whatever. It's just it's just true and absolutely wonderful. Um, you see a lot of people quote the, the rabbis. Um, about these different things that they say. Let me be abundantly clear. The rabbis are basically like Jewish commentaries on the Old Testament. They are not the Old Testament, and they do not have the authority of the Old Testament, just so we're on the same page. In fact, that's one of the things that astounded the Jewish, um, the Jewish people at the time was Jesus spoke with authority, whereas the rabbis were, were, spoke in this very circular, legalistic way. Does that make sense? If you read through the rabbinical literature, you know what I'm going to, you know, kind of what I'm talking about. But an instance of this is, is um, you know, this, all this backstory of King David, how he wasn't a legitimate child, and all this nonsense like that. Well, the Bible doesn't comment on that. So hypothetically, that could have been true. However, the Bible implies that he was an actual child, that he was just not really the favorite. Yes. <laughs> so, anyways, um, and obviously, um, it becomes an over focus on the nation of Israel. We have to support – America has to support Israel in every dumb thing that they do just because God made a promise to Abraham a long time ago. Now, that covenant – that promise developed into the covenant, which then the king, the kingdom of, of David got added onto that, and through that Jesus came. And through that all people have been blessed, and God has not forgotten his people Israel. Yes. However, this idea that, that God's just going to open up the floodgates of heaven to bless America simply because we, we give our thumb of approval to Israel is just stupid. And by the way, it's not backed up in Scripture. What, what God says with Abraham, you, those who bless you will be blessed, those who curse you will be cursed, that is, I don't have time to get into that, but that's not what he's talking about. 
first off. he And once again, even if he was talking about that, this is a nation far past that that isn't even Jewish in large parts, but is Israeli. Okay, Jewish is a religion. Israeli is, a, is an ethnic group. Okay, so let's separate the, and make the distinction there. Even if it did apply to supporting Jews today, it still doesn't apply to supporting Israelites in the land. Does that make sense? Because there are some things that Israel is doing that is, that is not moral. Okay, the same as there's things that Iraq is doing that's not moral. Okay, just so we're all on the same page here. Um, but it's just this idea, this confused place of of how does the Old Testament fit in today? You know, and because they don't know. And they don't really understand, you know, how to understand and apply it to our lives today. They just kind of run wild with it and create all these great, you know, uh, theories about Jewish this and Jewish that. Not that they're not good per se, but they don't rely on facts. They rely on just personal whim, which obviously is, is should be a huge fact, uh, 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 fear factor. Um, the Old Testament then is, is always spiritualized. It always has these secret deep meanings, you know, because Leviticus couldn't mean what it actually clearly does mean. You know, it couldn't possibly mean that. So everything becomes spiritualized. Everything. You know, like um, I, we're going to talk about this in a little bit, but like for instance, the, the marching around the, around the things to – you guys know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Marching around things to free it of, of spiritual bondage because Joshua marched around right. the city of Jericho. One event at one time. Yeah. To Israel in a physical conquering of a physical place, and somehow this has been spiritualized to mean that we should march around the sanctuary while we're worshiping. We should march around things that are cursed and all these different <laughs> nonsense like that. And that's not what he's saying at all. Not what he's saying at all. Okay. Once again, that just over spiritualizing the things that are true and making them just not applicable to the world. And you'll know that they're not applicable because one verse they'll say that, but then the very next verse. They'll just kind of ignore that same philosophy of interpretation. You can't switch your interpretation. There's one way to interpret the Bible. So um, everything's taken overly literal. In Revelations, for instance, there is literally a mark of the beast that is going to be the mark microchip or the cell phone or something like that. <laughs> and it is literally going to going to. It could be a physical thing that is on your body. Yes. However, in apocalyptic literature, things are are always metaphorical and only specifically. An actual thing when the author states specifically, okay? Like for instance, the lamp stands, and he John specifically says, "This is the angels, this is the churches, this is the." And see what I mean? But he doesn't say that about everything. See what I mean? With apocalyptic literature, you can't take everything as literal. And what they do is they take the same approach to everything in the Bible. Everything is literal, you know. Everything becomes literal, regardless of whether you know it's Psalms, which is a poetical book based off of people's desires and passions or whether it's ecclesiastes you know which it, which is a very misunderstood and mistranslated book you know things like that where they just take it way overly literal ecclesiastes says that all is vanity so what does it matter if i do anything because you know it's just doomed to happen anyways okay because that's what the bible says um I think I've kind of said that well enough. So now let's talk about tearing down strongholds. Something else that's taken drastically. I mean, it's kind of scary that what people mean take this to mean. This and uh, the whole binding things are two, I believe, two of the, the most harmful um, things that the charismatic cult teaches. Now, when I say charismatic cult, um, they are within the churches. They're not just like some people out by themselves. They're in the Sam's of God. They're in the uh, four square. They're in. I mean, they're they're everywhere. If it's a Pentecostal church, there'll be someone like that there. And the important thing, though, throughout all this, don't get caught up in the stupidity, and don't grow a hateful attitude. There are going to be people around you who believe some very stupid things that are very unbiblical. It's going to happen. However, that doesn't mean that we need to be so hateful all the time. See what I mean? Yes, it is irritating when people take the Bible out. It's like, why don't you just read the rest of the book? But anyways. <laughs> Uh, 2 Corinthians 10, uh, 3 through 5. Shh. Um, for though we live in the world, we do, not, we do not wage war as the world does. Okay, so already that should be giving us a red flag. He's not talking in literal terms. Well, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. Okay, another red flag. We're not talking about physical things here. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Okay, we demolish arguments. Oh, so what was the strong cause? Oh, arguments. And every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Recap. 
What were the strongholds? The thoughts. The worldviews that people have that are separating them from God. Basically what he's saying is having good apologetics. Knowing scripture where you can actually lead someone to Christ. See what I mean? Well, atheists, they have a stronghold in their brain because they're at this bias and this preconceived idea of, of what the reality is like. And we work through that through the process like he's talking about through reconciliation. He talks about that through the rest of the book. However, what this is then turned into is you literally have to pray down these demonic strongholds. There's like there's like these different like levels of demons and stuff, and they like they like have their 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 their, their castles and stuff in, in the cities, but they're spiritual and so you can't see them. And so you have to like pray the evil away and you know all this nonsense is like I don't remember Jesus doing that in any of the places that he went to. I don't remember Paul doing that in any of the places that he went to. He just went to the places and started pre preaching the gospel. Mm -hmm. And then he went and ta explained the gospel and he argued about the gospel. But he didn't just go in there and start praying away the, the demon these imaginary demonic strongholds. How do we know that the, these are, there are not actually these spiritual things that, that these people make this drastic thing about? Because it's nowhere else said in the rest of scripture that we should be praying against these things. And he clearly makes it obvious in the rest of the passage that he's talking about arguments, not prayers. He made that pretty clear. So, let's take the question then, are there demonic strongholds around us? To a degree, there is demonic influence in certain areas. How do we approach those demonic areas, however? If someone is demon-possessed, for instance, this would come in casting out the, the demon. Okay, there would be a way that that, that, that would happen. Okay, how is it not done? Um, you know, we're moving to a new city. Lord, I pray that you would break the bonds and do, 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 and all this magical stuff that's there and <laughs> surround us with a hedge of protection. Whatever the heck, what, what does that mean? You uh, can't jump over a hedge. No, no, I, I heard a comedian say that, and that's what Gracie's talking about. It, 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 it's, it's this, it's this, it's this piece of of, of yard. Um, it's a yard bush yeah. that keeps you safe, yeah. and you get around that, and the, and the greenery will keep Satan out. <laughs> okay, that's an idea. That's a very interesting <laughs> <laughs> But that's what people take it to mean, though. Yeah, that is what people so, take it to mean. Um, this idea of these strongholds, these ideas of these these strongholds, these, these imaginary demonic realms that are there that people have to, you know, pray out. That let me be abundantly clear. Christians cannot be demonically influenced unless they allow themselves to be demonically influenced. How are how are, how do we allow demonic influence in? Um, alcohol, drugs, uh, move, uh, movies that have demonic themes and that kind of stuff. Uh, certain people can can in certain circumstances do these kinds of things, but they don't. It's not something that that. I, I talked with a Satanist today. I need to go take a shower. <laughs> no, it's something where you are letting something into your life. Yeah. See what I mean? Yeah. And sometimes when you get out of that kind of lifestyle, it takes a good deal of fasting and praying to get rid of that kind of at an atmosphere in your household. Yes, absolutely. But that doesn't mean that there's some you know some ma imaginary thing to build an entire doctrine off of. The power of God is always talked about in the proclamation of the gospel always talked about in the proclamation of the gospel. Remember that. The gospel is powerful in and of itself to break the chains of bondage. Okay? It is, it is, it is beyond compare, and the word of God, made effective through the power of the Holy Spirit, is what the church needs. Not some super hyped up prayer. We don't need that. We do need, to, we do need relationship with God, but we don't need some super hyped up thing. Okay. Next up, the binding. Oh my goodness. There's three verses that are very difficult to, to um, translate in Greek because they all use the exact same wording. The first one's Matthew 18, and it's almost exactly the same in 1619. And the third one is towards the end of John. He says about, you know, um, those things. That he basically says the same thing, and if you read towards the end of John, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, but here in 1818, he says this. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Everybody get that? I'll read it again. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now this has turned into this really weird prayer 
movement thing and, and faith movement thing where you literally have to bind and unbind things on earth and this will in effect change things as it is in heaven this is actually it actually uses the same this kind of idea to back up the whole um, breaking down strongholds as well um, but however it's very <laughs> important to note that the Greek structure it's, it's this is definitely not what he's talking about definitely not what he's talking about um, I'll try to translate it in a different way but it's a little bit difficult to say in English, okay? Um, basically, whatever you bind on earth is something that has been bound in heaven. Already. And whatever you loose on earth is something which has already happened mm -hmm. in heaven. What does this mean for us? God has done something, and we proclaim what God has done. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? For instance... You used to be a drug addict. Then you are saved. You are no longer a drug addict. Why? Because I said so? No. The heaven reality, the heavenly reality. God has remade you, and as long as you, you know, obviously don't go back to doing that, um, you are. That's something that's no longer. See, does that make sense? Okay. So, it, I mean, it, it's abundantly clear when you read the rest of it, and also when you take into, into account that we can't substantiate the claim of, of binding and loosing things willy-nilly anywhere in Scripture. That gives the idea that God is just this genie, that you tell him what happens, and then he just does it. See what I mean? And that is very dangerous. And the reason why these two things are so dangerous, the tearing down strongholds, people uh, forsake forsake the proclamation of the gospel and the defense of the faith because they're so caught up in praying against these imaginary strongholds. Why is binding so dangerous? Because people actually delude themselves into believing that they have power over God himself. Not, they won't say, oh no, I don't believe that, but they do it in their actions. They do it in their words. Lord, we, we, we bind the spirit of, of gossip in, in Jesus' name. Just tag Jesus' name on the end of it. God knows why we do that. Um, but but somehow it's supposed to give some super spiritual thing to it. Okay, we're going to look at this in a little bit, but there aren't demonic things causing a bunch of things. Okay, we'll look at this in a minute. But every time something happens, we can't blame it on these demonic things that are going on. The Bible writers didn't. Jesus didn't. We shouldn't. Does that make sense? So basically what they do is they take these things and they, and they go rampant with those kinds of nonsense. You know, we bind the, and we bind the spirit of so-and-so in Jesus' name. First off, when you say in Jesus' name, all that is saying is I am acting in your ambas as your ambassador. Whatever you will is whatever I am praying. Okay, that's the meaning of in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray that you would bring these, these Muslims to, um, to, to the knowledge of you in Jesus' name. Correct usage. Correct usage. Lord... Zach's foot is going to be healed in Jesus' name. Incorrect usage. Unless God specifically said, I am going to heal that person's foot. Make sense? We do not tell God what to do. We are simply the servants of the king. Okay? We need to get that clear. This has been blown out of proportion to then imply that we are royalty. Because now we are sons of the king, right? Even though he calls us brothers and sisters. Whatever, um, and so we are therefore now royalty, and so we can now claim name and claim things because we are royalty. Wait, what? Like that one literally makes my head hurt. Binding is a very, very, very <clears throat> dangerous doctrine in the church. So go to the next slide. <clears throat> Special revelations. Oh my goodness, this is so rampant in the in the, in the Pentecostal world. Um, oh. <laughs> Where to start? Um, the first one is one that I've actually joked with about Ben a number of times, and that's – you remember Gideon when he was called, he asked for the sign where the thing would get wet and then the ground would stay dry and then the – yeah. Remember that? And so then they take that kind of idea and say, okay, so every time that God calls me to do everything, I need to ask for a special revelation, a special light from, light from above, a special encounter from God to validate this claim. God, if you want me to divorce Gracie and marry Zach – Make it where when I walk outside, there'll be a cat that purrs in the distance. See what I mean? Like nonsense. Nonsense. Complete nonsense. Now, that one's a little bit off the top. Uh, off the t you know, usually it's a lot more mild than that. Should I date this person? No. Um, should, should I go, should I go and, and tell this person about the gospel? 
If so, let there be a car honk. What? <laughs> Whatever happened to the leading of the Holy Spirit? Do you know how Acts begins? The, the apostles are all gathered together. They really have no clue of what's going on. So they just start praying. And then they think, well, there's 11 of us. There should probably be 12 because there's 12 tribes of Israel and there were 12 but with walking with Jesus. So let's appoint a 12th one. Okay. So then they say, well, it's this person, this person, let's cast lots. So they cast lots, and that's the person that they decide, Matthias. The rest of the book shows us how the church is now led with the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And then the Holy Spirit said this. And then the, being sent by the Holy Spirit, they went to... Mm -hmm. The rest of the book shows us the Holy Spirit leading. But yet, for whatever reason, the charismatic people completely ignore that and go back to these physical signs of special revelation. Or they do this in special revelation. God, you tell me what I need to know for today. Woe to him who builds his house by unjust gain. Yes, Lord. Help me to not build my house through, through working. But help me to trust in you to provide the money apart from work. Wait, what? <laughs> See what I mean? Things way super spiritualized, taken way out of context, or taken overly literal. Mm -hmm. Things that are just complete nonsense. Um, obviously, feelings become primary. Regardless of whatever the scripture teaches, if something was said mm -hmm. or you felt something, that's just the way it needs to be. And that's just the way it is. And there's no discussion. You can't talk about it. God told me. God said this. Special revelation from God. God told me this. God told me I need to go to another church. Well, that's kind of convenient because then you just get on in that tip with that other person. It has nothing to do with that. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm not saying that you're lying. I'm just – that's some really he, he coincidence and timing. Ways. Yeah, yeah. Well, and then they always cloak it with that kind of thing. He works in mysterious ways. And then they end up coming back to where they were like a year later. Well, God called me back. God is awful fickle. I mean he just changes his mind like this. You know, and it's just complete nonsense. Um, they, they never ask for advice. Or ask for help with praying with stuff because God always talks to them specifically and reveals things about his plan specifically for them and for everybody else too. God told me that you need to go do this. Even though he has not impressed in your heart at all, he told me this. And how is this damaging? Well, I'll tell you how. Let's say Zach has cancer. Okay. God told me that God's going to heal you. You can go and proclaim it to everybody you know. God's going to heal you, Zach. And then he dies of cancer. How is this harmful? Because you lie to people. It See what I mean? And yes, it destroys faith. And people who aren't even believers are going to say, what nonsense is this? Mm -hmm. Because you blew something out of proportion based not on scripture, but on your own desire of what you want to see happen. Mm -hmm. Harmful. Very harmful. In some ways, this is actually more harmful than Jehovah's Witness. In some ways. The charismatic cults. In some ways. I know more people who have not been saved because of care, or left the faith in general because of the charismatic movement, then I have n give up faith in general because of Jehovah's Witness. Just saying. I have personally encountered more people harmed by this. Um, testing God. Oh my goodness. Yes, everything becomes a test for God. Not only in the Gideon way that I just mentioned, but well, I'll show you. In the end of Mark, there's this ending in there that actually wasn't even in there until later, but they just included in your man in your Bible because just in case that it, in case it was divine. However, it is important to note that it was not originally there. Okay, so um, in in uh, Mark, let's see where is it, sixteen, seventeen through eighteen. Mark has three endings. the The first one is the actual ending. Trembling and bewildered, the women went and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. That's how Mark ended. Why did he end his gospel like that? Because he wanted to show the human weakness. Read through Mark, and you constantly see this, the human weakness. Mm -hmm. You see the, the disciples doing stuff, and you just shake your head and go, that was stupid. Why did you do that? Mm -hmm. See what I mean? Because Mark wants to show that human weakness. So how does he end his gospel? By showing the ultimate human weakness. Christ has, was the victor, and they're running off scared. See what I mean? The ultimate human, human weakness, or um, foolishness. Uh, 16, 17 through 18. Um... And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will drive out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink deadly poison, will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. Whew. Where to begin? Um, first off, 
snake handling is actually a thing that happens in a lot of charismatic, not a lot, in some charismatic cults, even today. Um, they have this idea, you know, that for whatever reason you need to test God. You know, uh, there's all, there's someone also uh, who who uh, you guys remember his name, the the guy that goes on the on the tightrope. I don't remember his name. Anyways, there's this Christian guy that does this tight roping thing, um, with 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 a uh, with a thing on um uh, blindfold. blindfold on, you know, with no protection all the time. Above skyscrapers. Right, right. Uh, w w w you know, with no protective measures and everything, and then the whole time claiming God. No, you learned a skill. And you're putting your life in danger every time you do this with no reason. Um, and then, you know, making people ha think that faith needs to be this super hyped up feeling within yourself. And that's not faith at all. Faith is this. Everything in me sees, says that I should give up. I don't see anything happening all around me. I'm doubting my faith. I'm doubting whether God's even hearing me. But I'm still going to seek him. That's faith. I don't feel like it. But I'm still doing it. That's faith. Faith isn't some magical hula that you ma that you conjure up within yourself to make yourself feel better in bad situations. That's just nonsense. It has nothing to do with faith. It, 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 Paul says it like this: We hope in things that haven't yet come. If it's already come, we aren't hoping for it. Right. It's the exact same thing with faith. We we we've, we have faith. Faith basically means trusting in God. Yes. It doesn't mean belief in God. It means trusting in God. That needs to be associated because a lot of people claim to have faith in God, but they just believe that he's out there somewhere. Mm -hmm. Well, that doesn't do you any good. Right. See what I mean? The majority of people in the world believe that there's a God out there somewhere. However, <laughs> that doesn't lead you to salvation, does it? See what I mean? So anyways, um, this just this idea of, of testing God, the handling of snakes, the dangerous habits and uh, unnecessary lifestyles, uh, eating whatever, and then just, you know, God will take me whenever he feels like taking me. Or you could eat healthy and exercise, and then God could still take you whenever the heck he wants, but then it wouldn't be got your years cut short because of your own stupidity. Right. Doesn't that make more sense? Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a loaded gun and point it to my head and pull the trigger, and if it's God's will that I live, it's God's will that I live. What? <laughs> That's the same bullcrap they did in the medieval times with the crusades and all that nonsense. It doesn't work. That's not what he's saying here at all. So anyways, um, not taking care of – I already mentioned all this. Um, slain in the spirit. Okay, so this is a, one that's a little bit hard to talk about. Is there such a thing as being slain in the spirit? Possibly and possibly not. Where do we get slain in the spirit from in the Bible? Any reference at all? None. There is absolutely no reference to being slain in the spirit in scripture. There are references to people falling face down in front of the presence of the Lord. And there are references of, like, for instance, when Solomon or Saul was among the prophets, how it seems like he may have potentially um, maybe like become so – the Holy Spirit was so strong that maybe he was knocked off of his feet potentially. Don't want to say anything for a fact, but it seems it's a possibility. Where does that leave us with being slain in the spirit? Seek God. Don't seek being slain in the spirit. If the whole if being slain in the spirit is real, you'll know it. The Holy Spirit will come on you in a very powerful way, and He will knock you off your feet. It's not something that you need to learn to fall right and all this nonsense. Like, who are we just talking about with this? The televangelist. Um, Benny Hinn. yeah, Benny Hinn. <laughs> My gosh, yes. We were joking. I don't want to offend anybody. We were just joking about some stuff with Benny Hinn. Anyways, um. You know this idea that that, that you know it, it, it's all based on, off of off of magical feelings of you know the tinglys basically, mm -hmm. and every time there's the, there's the tinglys, I need to throw myself backwards. <laughs> like how many guys, honestly, I, I I hope you guys have seen this to see what I'm talking about, where a minister will come in and they'll pray for you at the end and they'll breathe on you and you're supposed to fall when that happens. Oh, I saw that just today. Y yeah. So you guys have seen that? In the microphone, I'm like, what? You so you you've seen this? Has anybody yeah. else seen this? Now, the idea is there's something in psychology called social pressure. People will conform to what's going on around them just because they don't want to be the only person to not do it. Right. See what I mean? Yeah. Um, and so part of this is that. Part of this is they genuinely believe that something's happening mm -hmm. because they've hyped up all this nonsense in their head. Okay? Sometimes we can convince ourselves that something is true. Mm -hmm. My sister, for instance, thought she was drinking alcohol one time, and she, by the end of the night, was acting drunk. 
Why? Because your brain can convince you of things that aren't real. That's true. They, you can convince yourself of things that aren't real. You can literally send yourself to the hospital time and time again with illnesses only to have the doctor say, there is nothing wrong with you. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we can convince ourselves that things are wrong. Now, not every time that something's wrong <laughs> is it something, is something in your head. I, <laughs> let's get, get that straight because people always go to extremes on stuff. Um, but anyways, so if it is real, you will know it when the Holy Spirit himself knocks you on your feet. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Okay? Um, with that being said, I would lean to the side of caution with this because remember, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is the only thing specifically said to have no for to have no forgiveness. I thought somebody was knocking at the door. Sorry, um, to, to have no forgiveness. That's something that we need to be attention to. I wouldn't say there is no being slain in the Holy Spirit, and I would also not teach other people about being slain in the Holy Spirit. I would teach people to seek God. That's what I would teach. Mm -hmm. Just yeah, throwing that out there. Yeah, so. exactly. Let him do what he wants to do. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, be, be very, very careful with, with that kind of stuff. Um, so now let's talk about things like holy laughter, holy urination, rolling in the aisle, drunk in the spirit, those kinds of things. Uh, for that, we turn to 1 Corinthians 12. And this actually, 1 Corinthians addresses all these things where we don't have to talk about them individually. So in 12.7, it says this. Um, I'm sorry, I skipped past it. Now, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Okay, so first off, what is the works of the Holy Spirit? What's the purpose of it for the common good? So let's stop there. Holy laughter, who is benefited from that? If that. Holy urination, who is benefited? <laughs> nobody. <laughs> Literally, nobody. Seriously. And the janitor says no thank you, too. Um, rolling in the aisles. Rolling in the aisles. Who is benefited from this? Okay. Um, right? Drunk in the spirit. Who is benefited from this? Okay, so, the, so that should be our first red flag, that nobody is being benefited from this. Let's keep going, though. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge by the means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Okay, so now let's talk about another thing. Uh, Pastor talked about this. Can people have multiple gifts? Yes. Can people will themselves to have a gift? No. Everybody clear on that? Okay, good. Now, this is what we like to call an exhaustive list. Yes. These are the things that the that the, the gifts of the Spirit. However, there are some things that he doesn't mention, and for and for good reason, because that's not his purpose. Um, when you are initially filled with the power with the power of the Holy Spirit, you speak in tongues. Mm -hmm. That is something that that happens. Okay. Now, I do want to make note, but I I was using the gift of the Spirit, but I wasn't I didn't ever speak in tongues. When you are saved, a measure of the Holy Spirit is in you from the moment of salvation. This is something that's abundantly clear throughout Scripture, so I'm not going to waste my time teaching it. Um, then, being filled with the Holy Spirit is when the Holy Spirit empowers you, okay, and brings a restorative process on you in a very, I don't want to say intimate because that makes it sound very weird, um, but a very close way. There's no real way to define it. It's just something that when you experience it, you know what it feels like. And when you don't, you don't know what it feels like. It's that simple. Mm -hmm. However, there is no higher or lesser Christian because either you are filled with the Holy Spirit or you're not filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not that big of a deal. You know, It's not like the end of the world. I know a lot of good Christians have never been filled with the Holy Spirit. However, everybody has a measure of the Holy Spirit from the moment of salvation. Okay, We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Okay. However, it is important to note that Paul never foresaw a church that was not being used in the gifts of the Spirit. So that's something to think about, too. Um, <clears throat> but also, so, okay. So does that mean that there are other, could uh, possibly be other things such as these things, holy laughter and whatnot, that could be a sign of the Holy Spirit? Potentially, unless it's unbiblical. Potentially. However, we do need to be very careful about making these things up. Holy laughter. Um, I suppose someone could be overcome with joy. I suppose that could happen. It has happened. You know, I, I, that, that sounds like something that, that's not unbiblical in and of itself. Holy urination. No. Okay. <laughs> now, I do want to also point out that even if you were overcome with joy, you still, have the, uh, you still can hold in laughter, and I'll tell you yes. why. Um, 
12 or 1433 and this is something that for some reason the charismatic cult people completely avoid um, for God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, as in all the congregation of the Lord's people. Ba and then he talks about this throughout the, throughout the letter here, but I think this le this kind of sums it up here. Mm -hmm. The spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. Mm -hmm. God doesn't desire things to just be chaotic. Mm -hmm. That actually drives people away. Does yeah, that make sense? Yeah. And so what does it mean that the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet? It means that the prophet can or cannot speak. Mm -hmm. He can decide not to speak. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now there are the the rare occurrences, like for instance, Balaam. Balaam was a very wicked person. He did not serve God; he served all the gods, and God used him. Mm -hmm. Yes. And when he opened his mouth to say something, God intervened and made sure that he only said the things that God ordained mm -hmm. in those prophecies. Mm -hmm. However, this is the this is the exception to the rule and not the rule. Right. And keep in mind that he could have stopped talking. He kept opening his mouth. Okay? So, uh, that takes us to Galatians 5, 22 through 23, which I'm not going to really get into. Well, no, I will get into it. Um, and I'll, I'll get into it because it's, it is important. But the fruit of the Spirit, the, what the Spirit accomplish, accomplishes. And remember in 1 Corinthians that he talks about the Spirit, he talks about love, and then he talks about the Spirit. Why? Because it is, this is more important than anything. A Christian without love is pointless. Get that in your head. First thing in all this, in all these things, you can believe something completely ridiculous, and love, and be a heck of a lot farther than the person who believes all the right things and has no love. Right, yeah. Never forget that. However, um, we shouldn't pick and choose between the things. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Basically, we're just talking about here. There are evidences of the Holy Spirit, and that's basically what we're talking about here. If you are saved, there will be a process of, of, of change in your life that happens. It's just something that happens. Um, so is there any basis for holy urination? No. Is there any basis for rolling in the aisles? No. Not at all. None whatsoever. None whatsoever. Just so we're all clear. Um, this is a huge distraction from the Spirit, and when people are worshiping, they will be worshiping you instead of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. In fact, it becomes something that people seek after. Mm -hmm. Lord, I want to be slain in the Spirit. Yeah. I want to be more spiritual and be slain in the spirit. Lord, I want to be um I want I want you to come on me so much that I just I just completely lose my mind. What the crap are you even talking about? You know what I mean? God gave a God gave us a spirit of a sound mind, not of some nonsensical mind that just loses itself throughout the course of the day. That's just nonsense. It's it's not that's not something of a sound mind. Why does Paul not advocate people getting drunk? Because he says that we should be alert. We're not being alert if we're trying to be out of our mind, are we? Yeah. See what I mean? Oh, well, I don't drink, but I get drunk in the spirit. Okay, well, that's just a contradiction of terms. Because the spirit brings clarity, not drunkenness. Yeah. Drunkenness br brings – what does Proverbs warn about drunkenness? That you'll do things and not remember it? That, you, that you'll be sore and have, have these red eyes and, and you, have, you didn't sleep and you, all this nonsense happens? That's what he said. But how does that fit with the gifts of the Spirit? It doesn't. Mm -hmm. Of a sound mind, of self-control, mm -hmm. of gentleness. This is not in cohesion with the Spirit. Mm -hmm. So we can uh, testify once again, and also people, you, you never lose control. That's, mm -hmm. that's possession. The Holy Spirit does not possess us. Mm -hmm. Okay? That doesn't need to be noted. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So any questions on that? Just comment the, the comment away. Um, I completely agree, and the whole drunk in the spirit thing really is kind of a misinterpretation and over spiritualization of the the place where the Holy Spirit fell on the three thousand, mm -hmm. and people accused them of being drunk. Yeah. Um, but once, it, yeah. Well, I'm glad you brought that up actually, because I forgot to mention that. Oh, okay. There are two different kinds of, of speaking in tongues, and I'll just kind of mention them very quickly. One is one that has an interpretation, and one is one that does not have an interpretation. Mm -hmm. The ones that people publicly say in a church setting is one that has an interpretation. Mm -hmm. How do you know if it will have an interpretation? Do you know in your spirit whether whether to say it or not? Mm -hmm. So, other words, if you're if you're speaking in tongues and, and the Holy Spirit hasn't impressed on you to say it vocally, mm -hmm. what's going to happen is you're going to cause people to... First off, you're only going to edify yourself and not the church. Mm -hmm. Second off, you're going to scare people off. And third off, you're going to draw the attention away from the Spirit and onto you. 
which is a very dangerous place to be on because a lot of people in the Old Testament lost blessings because of that. Yeah. Just consider that. Um, but thank you for – how did I forget that? Um, dreams. Let's look at where this actually comes from. That's Joel chapter 2. Um, th this is another thing that can happen, but once again, is taken drastically out of context. Um, let's let's see what, it, what he's talking about here. In Joel 2.28, And afterward I will pour out my spirit on all people, your sons and daughters will prophesy. Excuse me. Um, your old men will dream dreams and, and your young men will see visions. Now, in the context, it's important to note the dream here does not mean something that I went to sleep and had a dream. It means more of... Um, like kind of like a vision. Okay, once again, with these kinds of kind of, of of Hebrew writing, it's called parallelism. It's two of the same thing said in a different way. Okay, so if the second one is visions, then the second one has to be synonymous with visions. However, can dreams be symbolic? Yes, they can, um, as we see in Daniel, for instance. Okay, that that's something that can happen. Um, however, once again, this needs to be taken with discretion. When you have a when you have a dream that the Lord wants you to know something, He will make it clear. Okay, I want that established because what people do is they have a dream. That's a weird dream to have, so you just attribute meaning to it and start just start making stuff up. You know what I mean? Um, I think this should mean this, and I think that that must mean Jesus. Ooh, and if that's Jesus, then I'm called to go to Africa. It's like, wait, what? <laughs> you ate pizza last night, crackhead. You know what I mean? Like things that things that that are very much. They ostracize the fact that we are physical beings. Yeah. Can I give an example? Just a second. They, 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 they separate us. We are physical and spiritual beings. Mm -hmm. To say that we are just spiritual beings caught in this physical body is just completely wrong. Mm -hmm. What does Paul say? That our physical bodies will be resurrected, right? There will be a physical body in, in, in the resurrection. It's, we won't just be spirits floating around. Right. Okay? We are not just spirits. God has made us a spirit and flesh. Yeah. So that does need to be noticed, regardless of whether we're dichotomous or trichotomous, it doesn't matter. Yes, give your example. Like, when we were growing up, every time we would dream about snakes, it was the devil. <laughs> <laughs> and we had to, it, like, if we were somewhere and we found a snake there, no. we weren't allowed to go there anymore. <laughs> That's, was that there. is funny. Um, was I talking to you? No, I was You were just talking about dreams and said that. Oh yes, um, do you know what it means when you have a, 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 a it's the same dream over and over again? Potentially nothing. <laughs> Just so we're all you know on the same page too. So don't feel like you know the Lord has cursed me with this dream. If it's a dream from the Lord, He'll impress on you. You will know that it's a dream from the Lord, and He will That's give clarification on that, yes. especially if you ask Him and seek Him. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Just so we're all on the same page. God does, God does not God does not does not give us a, a spirit of confusion. Okay. And a lot with the charismatic it is completely confused. Yeah. Completely confused. Go ahead and go to the next slide, uh, you. <laughs> so let's talk about prayer. Um, the first one on, on this... Pr did, did you guys see my clever titles? Go back one. Yeah, I know that one was funny. The weird, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> go back one more. Um, oh, is this called Lifestyle? Boring. Wait, no, you're going forward. Wait, yeah. We this thing before. is not working properly, FYI. It's drunk in the spirit, though. <laughs> uh, okay, that was not funny either. Go go forward back. I, I guess there was just the one that was that was funny. <laughs> Sorry, I failed you. I have failed you as a teacher. Um, and now this is failing. Oh, no. Maybe the battery is Maybe it is. I'll, I'll just flip here for you. There. Uh, you need to cast the demon out of that. <laughs> Which is actually what we're talking about now, casting out demons. Um, in the charismatic cult, everything has a spirit of something. So let me be abundantly clear on something. When something has something can have a spirit without there being spirits, okay, like for instance, there is a spirit here of learning. It's an attitude, not a, a actual spirit, okay? It, a spirit in the sense of an attitude, okay? Everybody clear on that? Uh -huh. That does not mean that there is actually a spirit that's hopping inside of you guys and saying, I want to learn. <laughs> now, um, evidently that was funny, so kudos me. Um, now also, in 1 Corinthians 6 1, for example, when there are different problems arisen in the church, does he ever say to cast out the, the, the demon of greed? He says, Stop suing people. Does he ever say to cast out the, the demon of sexual immorality or, or, or maybe sexual bondage? 
he says, stop doing this, mm -hmm. and cast the person out who's doing it. Right? right? right. Doesn't he say that? Yeah. And James 4, he says, where do these things come from? Do, don't they come from within yourself? Don't Aren't these temptations coming from you yourself? Yeah. So once again, what role do demons play? They can tempt us to do certain things. Okay. However, they only tempt on what they already know that you enjoy. Why? Because they read your minds? No, the demons cannot read your minds. However, they can read your behavior. They can watch you. Duh. I'm seeing your grandma. She she had a dog named Grizzly. Yes. Well, of course, the demon saw the dog. <laughs> That's stupid. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. Or even vaguer things, you know. I'm getting a, I'm, I'm getting a name. Oh, L? Yeah. L. Is your name Lauren? <laughs> Lindsay? <laughs> Ludicrous? <laughs> See what I mean? And, 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 and things like that where it's like, well, sometimes those are there, – there are – if you guys ever seen, seen the show Mentalist, there are some people who are just very good at perception. Mm -hmm. These are actually called mentalists. Mm -hmm. So it's a very interesting uh, show. You guys should check it out. However, there are people who actually do have demonic influence. And how would the demons know? Because they were there and they saw it. Right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's not that difficult of a concept. Um, so anyways, when we're praying for people, be sure not to be casting out demons of this and that. The demon of illness, for instance, is one I hear all the time. Or, you know, Chuck, I cast out the demons of, of, of legs not working or whatever. That would be uh, par par paralysis. Um, you know, just nonsense like this. No, no, no basis in, the, in scripture. Did did Jesus when he healed people, unless the demon was specifically causing that, did he ever say, "I cast out the demon of illness"? No. No. Sometimes when a demon was causing an illness specifically, he would cast out a demon and then, see you know what I mean? Okay. Deal with whatever situation left was to be left to deal with. Um, so, so that is something to note. Um, you know, and just be real careful about this whole spirits and everything. There's literally spirits behind every door, and sometimes indoors. Um, and and just complete nonsense, you know, casting out of everything. Pray for people, not against demons. I mean, honestly, it's not that difficult of a concept. Not only that, but I do want to just throw this in there. People have said some nonsensical things like, you give demons power by talking to them. I, I wanna, I, I've talked about demons before once, but I do want to hit back on this. Jesus talked to demons. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and not only that, but when you cast a demon out, you talk to the demon, and you tell them to leave. Right. Right? right? You don't so say, you Jesus tells power. you to leave. You say, I command you to leave, right? Right. 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 See what I mean? Yeah. So there is definitely this this complete un misunderstanding about the spiritual realm, and therefore they start making up stuff. Mm -hmm. what, what has Pastor been saying? I kid you not. He said it like a thousand times over the past right. week. Right. What happens when you don't read the Bible? You don't make stuff up. Exactly. You make stuff up. See what I mean? And this is exactly the kind of stuff that's happened. They read certain passages, and they highlight their favorites, and they ignore the rest, and they spiritualize things or take them overly literal. I don't understand how that those two things can even coexist. I take this overly literal, but I take this completely spiritual. Wait, what? But they're right next to each other. There is no break in thought. Why is this a thing? <laughs> Anyways, um... Um, claiming power over the angelic and demonic realm. I, I just want to give a warning, a word of warning on this. I'm not really going to touch on it that much, but I hear a lot of, excuse me, a lot of people saying stupid things about, you know, um, you know, basically acting like they themselves have power over demons and stuff, you know, in and of themselves. And I do want to give reference to this verse. Um, now Jude's purpose here is talking about people, um, feeling like it's their job to judge everything and, 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 and whatnot. You know, they're being disrespectful to authority, and they feel like it's their job, and they're just being very... But however, it's still, it does still apply. In the very same way, on the strength of their dreams, these ungodly people pollute their own bodies, reject authority, and heap abuse on celestial beings. Just be careful. Well, the, the devil, he's a big dumb head and stuff. Well, maybe, but let's just be careful about those kind of dumb things. Don't... Let, let's be careful about those kinds of things. We're trying to um, command angels. Or well, yeah, those kinds of things too. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, I, I, that is something that I've actually seen too, where people will act as though angels are their personal messengers, you know, yeah. or you know whatever. The, and we talked about this before, the um, guardian angels and all this nonsense, where where people get way off topic on things. And the thing that, that's especially difficult about this kind of an understanding of the Bible is you actually stop understanding the point of the text. 
-hmm. for the sake of taking things out of context. Mm -hmm. the, the passage in Revelations where it's talking about the mark of the beast, can anybody tell me what the point of that passage is? You can't. Why? Because people have made it a, such a big thing about a physical mark on your body that they completely miss the point. Mm -hmm. Read through Revelations and you'll see the point of the passage. Okay? Satan's role mm -hmm. in the in, in world economics. How he's how he's how he's causing things and, and nations want not to act immorally. Why, why, why won't America do this moral thing, and why won't they do this good thing and get out of debt or do this and, and, and support this? Because Satan, who is the prince of this world, is, by the way, influencing the world powers. It's not that difficult of a concept. But we've overemphasized on, the, on, rather, on this mark of the beast thing that we completely missed the point of the passage. Like the whole 666, and we're going to talk about this on Saturday with the New Testament class. What is the point of 666? God's number of perfection throughout Revelation is 7. 666 being that Satan tries to mirror the Trinity, but he always falls short. That's the point of the passage. We, that's it. So trying to make some code nonsense out, out of that brief thing, be very careful about such things. Be very careful. And so I'm not really going to talk about specifically this whole heaping abuse on celestial beings. Just... Don't get weird and stupid with the demonic realm. Mm -hmm. Don't get weird and stupid with it. But anyways, um, God told me in special words given especially to me, God told me this, God told me this, um, all these, and we kind of talked on this before a little bit, but uh, I'm not really <coughs> going to reference it too much since I'm running so long, but Galatians 6, one. is Galatians still even in my Bible? I'm sorry, not 6-1, that's 1-8. I knew it wasn't in 6. Um, and Galatians 1-8 says this, But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preached to you, let them be under God's curse. Now, keep in mind, we are not the people cursing them. Just yes. clarify that. However, um, he just said there very clearly, What's God's revelation to mankind? If only he would have written it down somewhere where we could look it up and then memorize it and then think about it and kind of get the principles from it and kind of apply it to other areas of life. Wouldn't that be wouldn't that be a good thing? God's revelation to mankind. That simple. You don't have to get some special revelation because he already gave it. How do you understand the Bible? You don't just open up to a random part and start reading. You study it. You study it. One woman, Dr. Bartell, one of my all-time favorite professors, he's just a great guy. It's good. <laughs> but anyways, um, and he told the story of this one woman who's like, I'm reading the Bible backwards now. I'm seeing all kinds of new things. And, and, and he went like this. I would say you are. <laughs> but anyways, um, the name and claim it doctrine um, is something that that completely ignores these three passages or three three parts of scripture. And I'm not even going to talk about where they get it from because these parts so completely contradict it. I don't need to talk about where it came from. Matthew 18 verses 19 through 20. Again, truly, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For there are two or three, for where two or three gather in my name, there I am. There I am I with them. What he's talking about here is not about prayer. He's actually talking about um, rebu rebuking someone in a church situation, um, bringing correction to someone. Um, and what he's saying there is when we, the leaders of the church, um, bring discipline in a church situation if we do it correctly like he's saying here jesus himself is with us mm -hmm. okay and he is condoning that action mm -hmm. not if a couple of us get together and pray about something it's just going to come true okay mm -hmm. and how do we know that the context the context mm -hmm. let's say i'm saying something like this i like monkeys because monkeys are pretty cool you know they're they come in a lot of different sizes um they're cool they have a lot of a lot of hair on them and um, I, I, I married one. <laughs> what, what did I marry? Well, I married Gracie, a woman. Why would you think that I married a monkey? Because the context, you were talking about monkeys. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? 
We can distinguish meaning by context. Mm -hmm. It's not that difficult of a concept. If I was writing a love letter, you would know what I meant in this part by reading the sentence before it, right? Mm -hmm. You wouldn't just randomly throw stuff out the window. So, uh, 2 Corinthians 12. Uh, you know that uh, most popular guy on, uh, um, in the world meme? I don't do this very often, but when I do, it's this. Oh, yeah. I don't read 2 Corinthians very often, but when I do, it's the two same verses I've been for a very long time. <laughs> uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 8-9. Um, Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. Completely contradicts the name and claim it doctrine. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. he prayed. He sought God. Mm -hmm. And God said no. Yeah. Yeah. What? Three times. <laughs> Three times he asked. And God said no. Yeah. No. <laughs> so, name and claim it doctrine. The fact that you can just name stuff and, and, and claim it as your own. Once again, very closely related with the binding and loosing thing. And I've seen people, it's very weird, praying in Jesus' name, they claim, but then they're asking for things that are based off of selfish means. Mm -hmm. What does James tell us about this? You ask and you do not receive because why? You ask with selfish reasons. You ask for your own personal gain. So, of course, your prayers aren't answered. And think about it. How many times do we pray for stuff based off of our own desire? Lord, help me from this affliction. Why? For your name's sake? Or so I don't have to be inconvenienced anymore? Yeah. See what I mean? Praying for our name's sake, and then just attaching at the end of it, in Jesus' name. Yeah. That is so unbiblical. It is and not only that, but I guarantee this. If you believe that for long enough, you will eventually tear yourself down, mm -hmm. thanking and claiming that you do not have enough faith. And it's your yeah. fault, because you don't have enough faith. Yeah. Yeah. And people will believe that too. You just don't have enough faith. Yeah. Yeah. Serena, Kyle has autism because you don't have enough faith. See what I mean? It becomes hurtful. Hurtful and unbiblical. Yeah. Just FYI. Um, so, uh, James 4.3, um, which is, I already mentioned that, so I'm not going to go there, but I am going to go to James 4.15. Uh, James 4, uh, instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. Once again, clearly contradicting this prosperity. So those three passages contradicted this this name and claim it doctrine. Mm -hmm. 2 Corinthians 12, 8, James 4, 3, and James 4, 15. All three contradicted name and claim it. So we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that such things are nonsense. They're nonsense. Yeah. So anyways, go to the next passage, or next thing there. Um, now I'll try to blow through the rest of these. Do you want me to just do it? Yeah. I'll, I'll just, I'll just I guess do it. Um, it, and about the last cell, temptation itself becomes evil. No. You sin every time you are tempted. Not when you lust, but from the moment of temptation, you, you sin. So that means Jesus sinned. No, no, he was sinless, but he was tempted. Well, no, he wasn't really tempted, but the word says he was tempted. Uh -huh. Fact. Right. Temptation, therefore, is not wrong. Lust right. is wrong. Right. People get very confused with this. I'm having, I'm having, I'm having same-sex attractions. It's it's a, it's a lust of the flesh. It, it'll pass. You know what I mean? We we are tempted in these things, and what do we do? We seek God, and we don't give in. Mm -hmm. Let's say I'm tempted to steal from Gracie. I'm not going to. Why? Because a temptation doesn't warrant my action. Mm -hmm. Let's say I'm tempted to punch Zach in the face. My temptation does not warrant action. Yeah. Does that make sense? Temptation is separate from sin. Lust is separate from temptation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'm married. Let's say I see a, a, another woman. I'm attracted to this woman. I start fantasizing. Sin. Mm -hmm. See? Sin. However, I'm attracted to this other woman. I think about something else. Not sin. Mm -hmm. Not sin. See the difference there? Mm -hmm. But for this kind, these kinds of people, it, the very fact that, that, that it entered into your thoughts... As something just shows how evil and wicked you are, and you have sinned, and you need to go, you pray the gay away, and all that all kinds of nonsense like that. The 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 things that well-meaning Christians have done that have co brought complete destruction on people, complete destruction. It's just uh, appalling, honestly. 
Um, holiness is fully attainable. This came from the Methodist movement. Um, John Wesley, if you guys are familiar with that, uh, I don't really have time to get into Christian history, but they taught this second thing of, of grace where holiness was, was the byproduct and it developed into this idea that we can become sinless on earth. Obviously a load of hogwash. Um, faith, I already talked about this, becomes power from within. It's not trusting in God, in God regardless of how you feel. It's just this, this power that you conjure from within yourself. Um, it's almost like that. Like that. Um, if you guys have ever seen Avatar: The Last Airbender, it's kind of like that. You know, this thing that you mm, within yourself. Yeah. We don't ever find power within ourselves. Mm -hmm. Jesus, God answered Paul and said, "My grace is sufficient for you." Mm -hmm. He works through us. It's not something that we find in ourselves. Mm -hmm. There is a difference between the Holy Spirit and our spirit. Okay. Right. Buddhism teaches that it's from our inner self. Christianity teaches from it's the Holy Spirit who works through us. Mm -hmm. Difference. One has a hyped up idea of what we are, our own worth. Um, also, real strong. This is awkward, very awkward songs. Um, Jesus culture is a big instigator of this. Um, the conversations that Ben, Chuck, and I have had on this. Um, basically, they're songs that that you could literally just take the word Jesus out, and you would literally think that you were singing a song about having sex. Very creepy songs, you know about the I lo uh, the way you touch me and all kinds of weird stuff. <laughs> We're witnessing to people who don't have Christian backgrounds. Right. Some of these people grew up being molested as children. Yes. And we're singing songs about God touching us. Let's take it easy. Take it easy. Okay? Calm down. Just calm down for a minute. Now, it's different saying, you know, the Lord worked on us or something, but you had to take out the Christianese first off. And second off, you have to stop making things so sexual. Goodness they sakes. actually have a song where they say, Jesus, I lust for you. Yeah. yeah. Just so that you know what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> or, you know, breathing you in the atmosphere and stuff. And it's good stuff, kind of, I guess, but just be careful. Ooh, be weird. careful. And and so then the awkward songs and conversations, they, the conversation always gets to the weird. You can be talking about anything and it gets to the weird. Like, I kid you not. You're talking about walking your dog out, and somehow you get onto this like this talk about about jubilee years with Israel, and you're like, "What are you talking about, jubilee years? What are you even talking about?" You know, and or one time, and, and Ben and Chuck, don't you dare say anything about this. I was talking to my guy. We we're talking about breakfast. I swear, and he got going about about how how positive and negative words caused rice to to to. What was the word they used to, to rot? To rot. If, if you put bad words on one jar, the rice would rot, and oh my, it just gets into dark areas. <laughs> dark areas. And somehow the conversation always goes there. It always goes there. So I had a pretty good BM. I mean, the, the poop on this thing. The Jubilee years. What? No! The Red Moons! And you're just like, no! No! But anyways. Um, and then, you know, the, the obvious awkward songs like, He's under my feet. He's under my feet. Satan is under my feet. Wait, what the crap? I thought it was under Jesus' feet. Well, in Genesis, it says about how the woman will crush his... Oh, my gosh. My head is hurting, please. Your stupid is, is overwhelming. But anyways, um, the denial of reality. We talked about this in Christian science. I simply will deny that it exists, and therefore it will not exist anymore. Um, I'm not sick in Jesus' name. Mm. That brings up, we do a song called Trading My Sorrows. Let's talk about that. I'm trading my sorrows, I'm trading my sickness for the joy of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Basically, what the song is saying is rather than focusing on all the bad things that are going on, mm -hmm. I'm going to focus on God. Right. That's the point of the song. Not, I'm going to deny the reality of these things happening. Right. The joy of the Lord is your choice. And you can decide whether to let, whether to, let to be happy or not. Yeah. As a Christian, not not as someone in the world, obviously. And we shouldn't teach to the world that they can just be happy by conjuring up feelings of themselves. That's just stupid. Um, like in Second Corinthians, the promise of the comfort, who is that given to? The Christians. Mm -hmm. So we should keep in mind these are these are divine things that come through a divine way. Okay. So many Christians I've heard talking to the world saying that all these things apply to them. It's just like no, no, they don't. No, they don't. Um, but this denial of reality, refusal of help from others. No. I, you know, I don't need you to pray for me because I'm blessed. Now, I talked about this before. I'm going to talk about it again. Sandy, people assume that this is what she's saying when she says, I'm blessed. No. When Sandy says, I'm blessed, what she's saying is regardless of the bad things that are happening right now, I, I'm still blessed by God. And that is true. 
we still have the salvation from God no matter what else comes our way we are still blessed from God nobody deserves salvation so that in itself is a blessing so yes we are still blessed however see and, and that's what I'm talking about Sandy is not one of these people she's had influence and in, 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 in interaction with these kinds of people but she herself is not one of these people um uh, but anyways, um, the bless in the context of this though. Nothing's wrong. Christians, we have it all together all the time. Oh yeah. Because I'm blessed. Yeah. Do you need me to pray for anything? No. The week was great. Um, blessed and highly favored. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> That's my favorite scene. Yeah. And and <laughs> and, and then and then when they uh, that I feel. <laughs> well the the reason why I I think that that's important to note is because they bring up the things of, from the Old Testament and. Mm -hmm. uh, so far out of context that literally my heart cries. No. Can you hear it? <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, it was like when we were doing that chicken. <laughs> Anyways, um, but just that clear denial of reality. You know, regardless of what's actually happening in the world, I deny it in Jesus' name. No, we can't do that. Okay, that's I the solution, like I guess. I can't deny it. <laughs> <laughs> um, another thing, bending God's arm. Your word says, and I, um, you know, so-and-so, and I have done so-and-so, hear my cry. Your word says that you will you will heal the land, and I have sought you. Okay, so because you've done, God has and God will answer. Well, no, um, but His word says this in context. See what I mean? Yeah. Just be careful with these. Also, real biggest formulaic blessings um, goes hand in hand with this kind of stuff. <sighs> they take the Old Testament and just quote it blindly to then apply that that means that you're going to get these special blessings. and It's almost like witchcraft, honestly, I, I swear. Um, you know, they say the little jingle and everything, and then it's all supposed to be fine. <laughs> like I say, just harmful things that are in the church. People don't... In fact, I know a lot of people who don't even pray anymore because this. So go to the... Oh. Yeah. Um, but wait, there's more! Um, okay. These people get very, very weird with the firstborn, with the priesthood of all, priesthood of all believers, and with Jewish bless blessings. So we've talked about Jewish blessings, okay? However, the priesthood of all believers. Whew. Peter says this in one epistle at one time. Mm -hmm. I don't recall anywhere else in all the scripture that calls us priests, okay? Peter was saying it for a reason, not just to blindly say that we are priests. Mormons take this to the extreme. Yeah. They say that everybody is literally a priest under either the order of Aaron or the order of Melchizedek. Mm -hmm. yeah. We are priests in the sense of we worship God mm -hmm. and we lead people to the knowledge of God. Right. Okay. We are not priests in the sense of every way that they mean it. <laughs> I, I don't have time to go on all the rants about the priesthood of believers, but that's just don't get weird with this. You have a righteous place as a Christian because uh -huh. you can worship God with nothing separating you. Yeah. Why? Because of Jesus Christ who is in the Holy of Holy Places. That's why. So therefore, you are a priest, a holy nation. Does that make sense? However, that does not mean that you should get into the weird with this. As, as, as a general principle, don't believe something too dogmatically when it's mentioned one time in Scripture. Mm-hmm. As a general rule, that that is when people start um, twisting other parts of scripture to reaffirm that part of scripture that they want to mean that. Does that make sense? So, um, and then the firstborn blessings, um, they just get kind of weird with this, you know. Um, you know, I, I planted this tree, but I'm not going to eat the first year's crop off of it because of this or that. Well, actually, if you want to be technical, I believe in the Old Testament law. It was the first three years you couldn't eat the fruit. Just Throwing that out there. And second off, doesn't apply to us today anymore. Right. Anyways. Right. So, it doesn't really matter about that. Um, oh, well, this is my firstborn son, so I have to uh, do something he's supposed to carry on your name and do the exact same job that you have and do the, everything the exactly the way that it just gets dark, 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 dark. Um, and then, you know, um, or some people, oh, I have, I have the blessings of the firstborn, even though I'm, you know, I'm the spiritual firstborn. And they just, it's like, what are you even talking about? Jesus is talked about as the firstborn mm -hmm. because he's trying to, the Bible is trying to, and I talked about this with him being the son of God as, as opposed to as being sons of God. I already talked about this, about the way that it's, point, that it's talking about him saving us. There's no reason to get into the weird with this. Generational curses. Mm -hmm. There is some 
application about this. Let me give let me give a, 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 a disclosure about this. My great my my grandpa, Grandpa Boar, was a drunk. My dad was a drunk. Some of my siblings have been drunks. So in that sense, the thing that the sins of the father do carry on like that. Okay. Another example. I know a lot of people with diabetes who their kids get diabetes. Okay. All right. We're on track here. But then to hop to this thing, you know, saying that uh, different things with. Let me just cut to the chase. When you are saved, even if there was some hypothetical generational curse that was demonically enchained to you, mm -hmm. it's broken. It's gone, even if it was there. Mm -hmm. With that being said, just don't get weird with this one. I, I, I honestly – there's so many things that I want to say that I have to not say because it's going too far. Also, end times fatalism. Oh my goodness. How many times they say just a sign of the times? Yeah. Oh, it, the America's down down the crap hole anyways, so so it doesn't matter anyways. Yeah. Okay, well there is a view. Um little history lesson in 300s in the 300s the, the church thought that that, that was the that, that was the great tribulation. And then Christianity was made legal where everybody pretty much almost had to be almost had to be Christian. <laughs> and then times didn't happen. Is America in a, in a place of spiritual decline? Well, we have a lot of people from a lot of different cultures and backgrounds. So I would say, yeah. Why? Because the isolations of Christians who weren't being Christians but were just isolating themselves in their stupid communities are being broken apart as America grows. Well, duh. That's a natural pro process of growing unless you want to be just a, plic a, plot of, a plot of isolated land that doesn't let anybody in ever. Well, that's nonsense. You see what I mean? Like it's 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 a it's a it's a it's a, it's a dream. It's not something that's actually based on reality. Um, uh, but there's this idea that you know, at the end times, there's nothing you can do and all kinds of stuff. You can pray. You can get active with the government. Mm -hmm. Christians can and should be involved with. I mean, hey, if there should there might be someone here who, who becomes a mayor, a governor, a, a president. That's fine. I mean, there's nothing wrong with a Christian doing those things. In fact, sometimes Christians can bring more change to those kinds of things than through um, through specific witnessing tactics. Just saying. Um, but however, you know, we shouldn't have this fatalistic attitude. I know a lot of people who have the, who have this attitude. And, you know, always talking about just you know, oh, there's nothing you can do anyways. Um, you know. Oh my gosh. You don't know that. You have no <sighs> idea. Honestly, this one's very discouraging because it actually moves people to inaction. Yes. Based off of it. Yes. Um, yeah. uh, also, another thing that you see a lot is no order in their services. Uh -huh. uh, they won't even prepare for sermons. They'll just kind of sit there and whatever happens, happens, and it's just like, whoa. So then other people go to the other extreme and have every second of the service uh -huh. down into a schedule. Yeah. Well, that's good for if you have a lot of people in the world coming, but the church is the, the church. We are the church. Yeah. You shouldn't have a, you should have uh, you should know what you're doing, but you shouldn't have every second scripted. Make room for the spirit. Right, exactly. Anyways, um, uh, these are all things that I'm just mentioning real quickly. Overemphasis on the end times. Everything becomes about the end times. Like the blood moons, for instance, it's no longer a, a, no longer something that God's put in the sky as a very interesting sign. American it now becomes what? American Pharaoh. <sighs> it, it becomes something, you know. It it becomes a thing where. Um, you know, it's it's just because of you know certain connections because it's on certain Jewish festivals or whatever. It's like, I I'm I'm very flustered about that one honestly. I don't I, the whole blood moon things. Really, <clears throat> First off, you have John Hagee, Mister. I will turn everything into something about the end times. Everything. What's that? You had a fart. Let me tell you about how this relates to to Jewish history. Wait, haven't we been in the end times since? Since Jesus, Jesus ascended, yeah. yes, hmm. yes. Two thousand years, nearly. <laughs> and so the point then being, <sighs> don't listen to these don't people who make their entire that. doctrine the end times. Yeah. And the charismatic people do this a lot too. Everything becomes about the end times. Yeah. Um, the prophecy in Daniel, it, it applies to ISIS, of course, of course. <laughs> who else could it apply to? I mean, wow. couldn't have applied to all these other people throughout history who they who they thought that it applied to. Yeah. The Antichrist, for instance, has been has gone from most recently. I think it was Obama. No, most recently we read that one thing. Remember, it was you and me, and they said 
uh, uh, by the way, it's not Obama. Remember, we were looking at that. Yeah. Um, so whoever that was, um, then obviously oh, Obama. Oh, yeah, the prince was. Uh, the Pope was in the medieval oh, yeah. church. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. Boy, there was Reagan. all kind. Of, really? <laughs> yeah. I hadn't heard that one. Wow. Because he had stretch. Ronald Wilson Reagan with six 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 in his names. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think that that's delving a little bit too far. <laughs> a little bit too far. Wow, that's dark. Um, I actually had another thought and then completely lost it. That's how out there that <laughs> statement just was. Uh, anyways, um, obviously talked about the power from within, declarations to God. You know, you basically declare things to God, and so so as it is unto you. Um, okay, so let's talk about where did Jesus go in the three days after he died. Where did Jesus go? I've been toying with Ben about this for a long time. Um, in the charismatic church, he went to hell, and he was bound up with chains, and he had to break them free. Remember how? Remember how he said, "Can you do it again?" How you did it was so funny. That, ah. That's been a long time ago. <laughs> it was like last week. Um, ben Ben was all saying he he's not he wasn't just in hell. He was in a cell with chains, and he's all blah, blah, and grabs the keys. And he's like, "Let me unlock." Oh, lockpick! You know, I don't even need keys. You know, um, and in fact, there's a Toby Mac song, uh, "Conquered the Conquered Death in One Breath and Unlocked the Cell." Remember? Okay. Mm, okay. Did Did Jesus conquer death? For the Christian, yes. We no longer have to be afraid of sin or afraid of death. Does that mean that he went to hell? No. Let's look at some of the passages where this comes from. First Peter. And once again, how many times is this reference in Scripture? One time. So what should we not do? Enforce a dogmatic teaching. Okay. First Peter. Um, chapter 3, 19. Um, the NIV says it like this. After being made alive, he went and made proclamations in the imprisoned spirits to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, in it only a few people, eight and all, were saved th uh, through water. And this water symbolizes baptism in the United States. You also, I'm going to stop there and go down to 4, 6. Um, for this is the reason the gospel is preached even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to human standards in regards to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. Now, in some translation, it says the, the gospel was proclaimed to the dead. And so that makes it sound like Jesus went and proclaimed the gospel to the dead. And then to affirm that, they go back to this verse right here, which in the NIV, I think, um, obviously shows a lot of bias. Like if you notice that passage, it says, who are now dead. Mm -hmm. They do it for you, so you don't have a strange doctrine in there. Um, and then right here, um, they do it a little bit differently. Does anybody have an ASB or an ESB? What do you have? NASB. And what do you have? ESB. Okay, you go first, and then you. Okay, what am I reading? Uh, First Peter three nineteen through twenty. Wait, what? First Peter three nineteen through twenty. That's the one on the screen, buddy. Okay. Well, I was there, but somehow I went to second Timothy. <laughs> uh -huh. I, I don't know. No, I believe you. <laughs> 319. Uh-huh. Through 20. Through 20. Okay. All right. In which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison, who once were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah. During okay, stop there. He went to the spirits in prison. Okay. Now. In which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. See? Very similar. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, uh, let's go ahead and stop there and just kind of talk about what he's talking about here. First off, it is appointed for man once to die and then the judgment. Okay. That's something worth noting. And scripture also talks about um, the way that um, – I lost my train of thought there. Sorry. Uh, um, the, the pretty much – at death, that's that's the end for for the chance of salvation. But then, if that's true, then that would mean that Jesus gave these people the same chance. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. Well, then, well, these are the people from the Old Testament who didn't get a chance to hear. That's based off a misunderstanding of what the Old Testament is. Romans says that there is none without excuse because God made Himself known through both conscience and through nature. That kind of does away with that anyways. Second off, in all of the times that 
God talks about Abraham and whatnot, where does where do they talk about him being? In heaven, right? With the the rich the rich man with Lazarus, remember that? Yeah. He was he was where was Abraham? In heaven. And where was where was the rich man? In hell. So that implies, and Jesus on the cross, what does he say? Today you will be with me in paradise. Mm -hmm. Some people say, oh, well, that's that, that's a different, that's not heaven, that's paradise. Not, no, and in, 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 in usage paradise in this context definitely means heaven, especially in the fact that, that Paul referenced it to as paradise, mm -hmm. and he was clearly talking about heaven. So there's something too. Um, three other translations that work with what the Greek is saying here. Um, it's a little bit difficult because it's Peter. I'm not going to get into that. Um, so the first, that Jesus proclaimed to the demons of his victory. Possibility from the text. I wonder the validity of this. Craig Blomberg, for instance, is, is, advocates this view. I, I, I wonder the validity of this claim because why would Jesus go and gloat to them? Right. And what does that have to do with, with the flood of Noah? The second view, which was made popular by Wayne Grudem, a very, very good Reformed theologian, um, was the idea that in the Spirit, Jesus proclaimed through Noah to the people during the time of the flood. Basically, Jesus, through Noah, was preaching to people for salvation. That during that time that Noah was working, basically then it would be translated... Um, uh, after being made alive um, in the spirit, um, he went also in the spirit to the pr to the prison. Does that make sense? Does that kind of make sense? Um, obviously, the different translations are going to give you a little bit of a hard time with this. And then the third view, which I personally don't agree with, because it's you you have to make up this this other heaven place um, that the Bible just doesn't give us adequate su sufficient claim for, is that Jesus went and told the Old Testament saints. But once again. The Old Testament were, saints, were, they were saved. Yeah. Not by works, but by faith in God. The same as we are saved in faith in God. Right. So that kind of... A little yeah, bit lacking. So then they kind of reference the new heaven, the new earth. Well, yes, but that doesn't relate at all, or at least doesn't sound like it relates to the Old Testament saints and where they went. So that's a little bit... I don't really agree with it, but the only view that we know cannot be true is the view that people say that Jesus went down to hell and that he um, gave people a second chance. Okay, so let's talk about let's talk about um, the rest of what Scripture has to say about where he was. Jesus came to save us from the wrath of God, not Satan. Therefore, there was no reason for him to be in hell. Mm -hmm. right. They point to that passage. He became sin. It does not literally mean he became sin, as as <laughs> Hebrews says. Yeah. He was sinless. How could he have been sinless if he himself was sin incarnate? No. He's obviously not saying that. See what I mean? The, <laughs> that should be noted. Um, but then also, sin angers God, not Satan. Satan couldn't care any less than he already does. Uh, you know what I mean? In fact, he likes sin. He likes for you to do things. Why? Because he so hates God that he wants anything to separate. Exactly. Um, and, and so then... Um, obviously, this also is based on the idea that Satan is, you know, down in hell, you know, with his whip and everything, you know, you know. But no, he's out in the world, you know. Yeah. Hell, hell is where people go for eternal punishment. Right. So. Um, okay, so let's look at some other passages that strongly say that more. Um, the view in Greek that I think is most likely from the context is that he's saying that um, that. <coughs> That Jesus, the, the reason why Craig Blomberg says that, that Jesus was proclaiming to the demons was because spirits here is always translated, and in the, in the way that it appears in the sentence is always translated as, a, as a, an angelic kind of being. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, however, I don't think that that's worth warranting the fact of saying that that here, as it doesn't really apply to the Noah thing. Um, I think Wayne Grudem is pretty on target when he when he says that he's saying you know um, that Jesus uh, during was 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 raised in the spirit from the dead, and he was also in the spirit that he was prophesying through Noah back in that time, or preaching through Noah. Does that make sense? Kind of like two separate incidents. Yes, he was raised in the spirit, and it was also in the spirit that this happened. Right. Um, See what I mean? Makes a lot more sense, doesn't it? 
It's like when when people talk about the angel of the Lord back in the Old Testament, uh-huh. they think that that is usually referring to Jesus. Well, yeah, and there are some parts where it could be. Um, in, in fact, the spirit, it, he is. Yeah, yeah, and in fact, that's an interesting point. Um, some parts it is very clearly Jesus because you know, first off, nobody has seen God, and yet they see the angel, and and they talk to the angel as though he is God, and the angel doesn't reprimand them. Right. An angel will never receive praise for God. They are just the messenger. If you remember in Scripture, what do they say? No, stop. stop, stop. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not don't do that. Don't worship me. No. So um, now a demon, I, I, you know, they're they're their own thing. Whatever. They're they're angels that have fallen. So obviously they're not overly concerned with obeying God. But keep in mind that they that angels will also be judged. Keep yes. that in mind too. Um, Luke 16. Um, 19 through 31 tells the story about rich, um, the rich man and Lazarus. Um, you can read it, read it through there for yourself, but it, it you know obviously talks about Abraham as though he is in heaven. Mm-hmm. Um, 23 through 43. Also, that brings up well, where do where would the Old Testament people, the Jews at the time of the Old Testament, where would they have thought that they were at? Well, for the exception of people like Sadducees, heaven. Okay. So, uh, Luke 23, 43. Um, an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. That can't be right. 23, 43? I mean 22, 43. Sorry. Um, it helps when you look at the right place. Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Um, 2 Corinthians 5, 8. I'm not saying that Jesus didn't necessarily go in into this mythical place, and that you know the Old Testament saints had to hear that. I'm just saying it doesn't make sense, and there's no biblical basis for it. Okay, um, so draw your own conclusions, I guess. Second <laughs> Corinthians uh, five eight, I think I said yeah, um, says uh, we are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. He's not saying that we are going to be spiritual beings without physical bodies here. He is saying to no longer live, to be no longer to be alive, you are in the presence of the Lord. So where would Jesus have been if he was no longer alive and was without sin? The presence of the Lord. Pretty clear, right? I mean, that seems pretty clear to me. Um, so now let's go to James 2.21. Now, once again, I mean, you can't take one vague passage and make a doctrine off of this. You, you can't do it. Could there hypothetically have been a situation where Jesus may have done something? Well, I guess there I mean, there may have been if he wasn't giving a second chance to anyone. Mm-hmm. Which would then mean that the Old Testament saints were saved, but they still had, Jesus still had to come and say and say, Here I am. Either way, they're not, get, they're not receiving salvation. They were already saved. They were just waiting for Jesus to come. Mm-hmm. Once again, though, that's a little bit weird, but it's possible, I guess. Once again... No biblical basis for it. The passage in Peter doesn't necessarily say that. It could be twisted into saying that, but he's not necessarily saying that. So it's very important not to form a doctrine off of vague parts, especially off of vague parts in Peter, because Peter says things very weird. Like It's like John. John is very focused. Like If you read First John, he says, anyone who sins is not saved. It's like, whoa, John, whoa. I don't know about you, but I sin. You know, and, and what he's talking about is people who continue in sin versus yeah. people who, who are who are struggling in sin. You know, he's, yeah. he's clearly talking about these things. But that's his way of writing. Right. Paul, we're familiar with his way of writing because he's got the most letters in the in the in the New Testament. Mm-hmm. So we're most familiar with him. Him and Luke. We know them backwards and forwards. Yeah. But these other guys not so much. Right. You know? Right. Um, James two twenty one. Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? And therefore, if he was considered righteous, why would he have not have gone to heaven? As the argument would go. Um, the people before Christ went to heaven or to hell, respectively. Um, and there's no biblical basis that they went somewhere else. Um, this is a, this is a, Where did this view get going? Well, I will tell you. Uh, his name was Kenyon. E. W. Kenyon, if I remember correctly, and he was real big into this into this kind of stuff, and he taught a lot of weird things. And just so you know, 
this wasn't the only weird spot of his doctrine. He also had other things in his doctrine that was off. Um, but this was probably the biggest thing. Um, but yeah, any questions on that? Because I don't want to leave anybody wondering. No? Okay. All right. If there are any questions about this in the future, ask them. And I will answer them. Um, were there any questions about in, about the lesson at all? No. Okay. All right. Um, now, about that passage in First Peter, I am sorry that your translations get that. It just that's the negative side of having a translation rather than knowing the actual language. Mm -hmm. There's parts like that where, like for instance, the bi the binding and loosing. Mm -hmm. There's parts in scripture where they just can't translate it in a way that you would. Yeah. Get the grasp of the Greek. That's just yeah. there is no direct overlap with any two languages, and that's just the way it is, you know. So mm -hmm. I, I'm sorry that that passage is confusing, but try not and try to understand the overall context of what, what he's talking about, you know, with the judgment and whatnot, mm -hmm. and, and and you know. So, anyways, so next week we're talking about oddball religions or cults, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, there's uh, actually quite a few different things there. Um, I believe we're also looking at uh, the impact of the cults in the in the Christian church. Um, I don't remember, though. Um, mm -hmm. The next couple weeks are crammed full of stuff. I'm really excited. That's why I'm recording all of them. Um, and we will also talk about the Seventh-day Adventist and, and that kind of stuff. But real briefly, we're not going to look at any of them real strong. If you guys have like any of the cults, they're, they're the ones in the appendixes that we're looking at. Uh, however, real quickly blowing over, just basically mentioning in very brief what they believe, and they're just kind of moving on. Yeah. Um, so, okay, we're done then. <laughs>